Walt Disney's Disneyland. When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Each week as you enter this timeless land, one of these many worlds will open to you. Tomorrowland, promise of things to come. Fantasyland, the happiest kingdom of them all. Frontierland, tall tales and true from the legendary past. Adventureland, the wonder world of nature's own realm. Presenting this week from Adventureland, the Yellowstone story and Bear Country. And now your host, Walt Disney. In our True Life Adventure series, we've told the stories of many of nature's creatures, and we've always made it a point to show them in their natural settings. For somehow, an animal always seems more natural in his own environment. When we did the story of the African lion, we sent our cameraman to the one place where we knew the story would unfold, Africa. When we told the biography of the beaver, we went on location to the actual spot where the beaver built his dams. For the story of the American black bear, we went to his natural habitat. Now the story we found there was called simply Bear Country. Later in the program, we'll present the uncut theatrical version of Bear Country. But first, we'd like to take you to the bear's home grounds for another story we found there. Actually, Bear Country was Yellowstone Park. And while filming our true life adventure, we came upon some interesting background material, the story of the park itself. And now, as a prologue to our story of the bears, we present the Yellowstone story. And here to tell it is our true life writer and director, James Alger. Of all the 29 national parks, Yellowstone is both the largest and the oldest. As a matter of fact, its official beginning as a park dates back to 1872. But the complete Yellowstone story goes back even earlier than that, to the time of the Lewis and Clark expedition. It was in the early 1800s, on the way back from Oregon, that a man named John Coulter decided to strike out on his own. And after a hike of about 500 miles, he literally stumbled into the Yellowstone region and became the first white man to see its wonders. This was a fantastic land a land where ghostly columns of living steam rose from the earth. The natural wonders of this region seemed almost supernatural. In fact, to the Indian, this was the land of burning mountains, the home of evil spirits, and thus a place to be avoided. Upon his return east, John Coulter tried to tell the outside world about what he had seen. He described fountains of scalding steam erupting beside cold mountain streams. He told of bubbling cauldrons where nature seemed to be mixing her pigments. He spoke of springs of boiling water, but to no avail. People would not believe that such a place existed. They scoffed, and to show their derision, called his discovery Coulter's Hell. In later years, of course, they followed in Coulter's footsteps to see this weird land for themselves, and soon discovered that his amazing reports were hardly exaggerated. Yellowstone was then, and remains to this day, a truly fantastic place. Originally, visitors came here on horseback and in wagons, for Yellowstone dates from the stagecoach era. But today, they arrive in automobiles, buses, and house trailers. The scenic highlights of Yellowstone are connected by the Grand Loop Highway, and all attractions are accessible by car. The Park Service maintains 145 miles of paved roads and some 900 miles of trails. As a nation on wheels, we travel to our wilderness areas with considerable ease. And in this park, the total number of tourists during the summer season exceeds 500,000. 
A half million people every year come here to enjoy their heritage. A national recreation ground preserved and protected by the National Park Service. Of course, roughing it nowadays often includes all the comforts of home. And the tourist's vacation castle is very apt to be a collapsible house trailer, neat and compact for the road. When it is finally erected, it contains sleeping accommodations for four people. Or perhaps an inflatable tent takes care of the shelter problem. For those who demand a proper lodging, there are well-furnished cabins to be had at the various hotels and camps. The geysers are the star attractions of this park, and there are some 3,000 of them located in six different natural basins. A geyser is a show in itself, and these in Yellowstone never fail to perform. A geyser is actually a hot water volcano, and sometimes, to the consternation of the visitor, the warm mists fall much too close for comfort. In these boiling cauldrons, the water temperature often reaches 200 degrees and more. At this altitude, this is the approximate boiling point. And thus, these waters are always so near to boiling that it takes only a gentle stirring to start them bubbling. A placid pool is the exception, but a few do remain undisturbed. This is the famous morning glory pool, a hot spring whose waters are so clear that its subterranean sources can be seen. Among the volcanic wonders of Yellowstone, one geyser is the most amazing of all. This, of course, is Old Faithful. True to its name, it erupts every hour, and its performance attracts great crowds. There is one view, however, that few people ever see close up, the geyser's actual mouth. Through this small opening pass 10,000 gallons of water each time it erupts. Before each performance, the camera fans make last-minute preparations. Check f-stop, shutter speed, color temperature. Everything must be just right for the picture to show the folks back home. The interval between eruptions has occasionally varied from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. But generally, it's an exact 65 minutes. And in all the years since its discovery, Old Faithful has never been known to miss its schedule. So, right on time, a mysterious rumbling is heard deep in the earth. This natural spectacle attracts visitors from all parts of the world, even from faraway India. It remains a truly fantastic phenomenon in this fantastic place called Yellowstone. At the park headquarters, Mammoth Hot Springs, there is found the most intricate volcanic architecture of all. These springs flow from a limestone formation, and over the centuries, they have built an enormous terrace of colored rock, laid down grain by grain and pool by pool since the beginning of time.
its northward journey to join the Missouri, the Yellowstone River has carved out a great gorge. Here is revealed the yellow rock that gives both the river and the park its name. And here, rivaling the Grand Canyon of the Colorado, is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. The mighty river plunges over a precipice twice the height of Niagara. An excellent view of this great cataract may be had from various vantage points along the rim. And for the visitor with a sharp eye, there are other attractions too. Down in the canyon below, the osprey, or fish hawk, builds its nest on these inaccessible crags undisturbed by man. For this skillful catcher of fish, the neighborhood provides a bountiful fishing ground. And many a good-sized trout is brought home to the young. It's in the river valleys that the tourist often gets his greatest thrill, the chance to observe wildlife in its natural setting. Here, along the marshy bottoms, the majestic moose comes to feed. Here, the tourist may watch the elk, and if he's lucky, get a snapshot. The pronghorn antelope is another who roams these upland valleys. And here, too, exists that symbol of the Old West, the buffalo. Under government protection, the ancient herds have staged a comeback from the very edge of extinction. But perhaps the most popular of all the wilderness residents are the bears. Here on the Grand Loop Highway, is a scene typical of bear country as the tourist usually sees it. For most travelers, this personal contact with Mr. Bruin becomes a highlight of their visit. Indeed, the bears are so entertaining and their antics so nearly human, it's easy to forget that they are in reality wild animals and potentially dangerous. against park rules to feed them. But human nature being what it is, and bears being what they are, this regulation is hard to enforce. The one tourist not interested in a closer look is the family dog. Instinctively, he knows danger when he sees it. In his zeal for a souvenir picture, the tourist sometimes makes the mistake of getting between a mother bear and her cub. This can lead to serious trouble, for the maternal instinct of the female bear is highly developed. And if she thinks her young are being threatened, she will quickly revert to a ferociousness unmatched in nature. But in spite of all rules and regulations, the public will insist upon visiting with the bears. Father Bear, meanwhile, parks himself in the middle of the road to entertain the tourists and tie up traffic while others of the Bear Clan check the cars and collect admissions for the show.
This roadside encounter with the bears will be good for many a retelling back home. And it is often the visitor's favorite memory of bear country. By mid-September, the last of the vacationers depart. And soon, nature reclaims this wonderland as her own. The Yellowstone country lies at an average altitude of 7,000 feet. And winter snows often pile up in drifts 20 feet deep. Even in winter, Yellowstone remains the land of hot water, for winter's bitter cold cannot conquer the geysers. And so they go on erupting according to their custom. In the cold air, however, the great clouds of steam quickly condense. And soon, the trees of the surrounding forest are covered with strangely beautiful patterns of ice. Thus, in winter, as all the rest of the year, this land remains a fairyland where strange things continue to happen in strange ways. And in her vast wilderness laboratory, nature will go on creating her fascinating mysteries for as long as time shall last and for as long as man shall leave her work untouched. It's true that the bears are the outstanding attraction of Yellowstone Park. But there's another side to their story, a side that most people never get to see. It's the story of how bears behave when no tourists are around. It's the tale we tell in bear country. And here now to bring it to you is the voice of our true life adventures, Winston Hibbler. When the continent of North America was a virgin wilderness, wild bears ranged from coast to coast, and from Hudson's Bay to the Gulf of Mexico. In the time of the Indian, and even through the frontier period, all of America was still bear country. But as each new territory filled with population, the bears retreated deeper and deeper into the backwoods, until today they're concentrated mainly in the Rocky Mountains. Here, the American black bears still exist in plentiful numbers. And this true life adventure is the story of their unusual way of life. The story begins with bear country still snowbound. These frozen slopes seem empty and lifeless. And yet there is life here, though most of it's underground asleep. For this is the realm of the hibernating animals. And finally, in accord with nature's strange and intricate timetable, these rollicking animals end their true life adventure as they began it, deep in sleep. A long, tranquil slumber that will continue undisturbed until the time of easy living comes again to bear country. Mm -hmm.